you very much. Uh, as, as my uh, previous uh, colleagues, uh, I would like to thank uh, Carlos and Prem for putting up this, for organizing this, uh, this event and for giving me the opportunity to uh, speak. I will be talking about some work in progress with uh, uh, Gabriel Wong and, and, and Thomas Martens. And uh, in, in a nutshell, uh, the, the, the kind of question that I that, that I will be asking today is uh, there has been a lot of progress, uh, mainly in ADS-CFT, in understanding the emergence of uh, bulk locality. Uh, but I'm, I, I'm more interested in not using the boundary CFT information. Uh, and uh, I'm interested in exploring the question of um, you know, what, uh, you know, in a fancy way of phrasing this, or in a literature way of uh, phrasing this, is uh, what, what keeps space-time glued together from a bulk perspective. This sounds like a terribly badly defined question in our current understanding, because it may suggest that you need to solve a string theory uh, in order to understand what entanglement means if you don't refer to a boundary CFT in the first place. Uh, or some matrix model, as, as Sean was alluding to, uh, also in, in his talk. But, but, but that's the kind of question, so I would like to ask this question from the bulk perspective. And since, since in general, I don't know how, how to do it, uh, we were inspired by, well, uh, uh, there was a lot of progress in JT gravity, uh, not as a fully, viewing it as a fully microscopic theory, but trying to define JT quantum gravity in an independent way of any UV complete theory in the full string theory. So, so the kind of question which is not captured in my talk is, is along these lines. I want to ask whether by revisiting our understanding in, of, of 3D gravity along the lines of JT, we can achieve a similar kind of a proposal. So that will be the first part of, of this talk. And then, uh, out of the answer that we will get, I, I want to, to try to probe that structure and see whether there is some notion of if you allow me to start using this language, some notion of uh, edge modes uh, that, that can explain why there is some, there is some horizon uh, gluing the two parts of the diagram that also show up in, in Sean's uh, talk. So that's my plan. Uh, we'll see if, if I succeed. It's the first time I talk about this, so I may have taken wrong decisions. We shall see. So since I already know that I will be running out of time, uh, <laughs> And I've seen that some speakers have this uh, great uh, policy, though some people may uh, disagree. Let me tell you what is the takeaway message, or some, my summary of the takeaway message. So from the 3D perspective, if, if you want to take a slogan, and maybe this is a little bit too technical at this point, but you will see more explicitly what I mean, our proposal is, is that the JD analog of 3D is some theory of vacuum virasoro blocks in the dual channel. This is a very well-known technical statement in the literature, but I'll try to observe that that universal behavior at high temperature in irrational CFTs have the features that, that we were interested in. If you take the perspective of the Chern Simons perspective, what is going to happen is that the standard boundary conditions that people use on the holonomy on the spatial cycle is going to be flipped to, with the time cycle. This is going to break. Uh, this is going to uh, break the, um, the modularity of the 2D CFT, which was what Witten and, uh, and, uh, and Alex Maloney were trying to impose in the individual. So our, our model is not going to be a CFT. It's not even modular invariant, but it will capture uh, the, these features. So that's, that's, that's the message. From the bulk factorization perspective, uh, what I would say, this is just a picture, because I don't think that this is what we would like to claim, but in terms of presenting the picture, it's nice to make the claim, which, which was already alluded to by, by Matt Gauff and Berlinde in some paper a few years ago, is that you, you should be thinking about the BTC black hole as a Wilson line. There is no really geometry attached to it. Uh, I would like you to think about it in terms of a quantum state as, as a Wilson line. And then when you split the Wilson line at the horizon of the black hole, when you do the calculation in the heart of Hawking uh, in the semi-classical approximation, uh, what allows you to split the Wilson line, so if you look at, uh, at this picture in the right, you should be thinking about this dashed line as the bifurcation surface in the talks this morning. And then there are some extra degrees of freedom in the bulk 
This is what would happen in, in electrodynamics, so I'm just appealing to, to that picture. There are some uh, H modes, and what I would like, uh, this is what allows the Wilson line to break and end there. And at a technical level, uh, sorry, I pushed the wrong button too many times. Or maybe, yeah. Uh, so, so, so at a technical level, if uh, what, what I'm planning to do is to revisit this in JT, where some people claim to have understood the answer to the problem of bulk authorization, and and what we will be able to compute uh, during the talk is some density of states for the H modes living on this on this uh, entangling surface, and in our approach, the main technical equation that you should remember is that we. This is, a, this, is, this is the way in which we will try to implement locality in our setup, even though everything is quantum mechanical. It's this condition that was proposed, if, if I am not wrong, for the first time by Donnelly and Wong, which says that if I give you, if I compute an annulus partition function, and I take the limit of removing the, one of the holes in the annulus, which is this epsilon uh, modular parameter, if I take this to zero, I should recover the this partition function. That's a well-defined calculation that with the tools that have been developed you can compute in JT. And from this condition you extract a non-trivial density of H states and the, quant, uh, and the group under which they transform. And the group that we obtain is SL2R plus. This is literally, this, it's a semi-group in fact. It's, not SL, it's the same definition as SL2 but with the elements of the matrix being positive. If we do the same thing in 3D, then we get a quantum deformation of this group, but we also get the same, the, the same picture. The technicalities are more involved. And what I would like to highlight is that our analysis pushes further what many experts already know, which is that Chan Simons is different from 3D, 3D gravity, and the H mode sector seems to also know about it. So these statements in, in Chan Simons are different. These are the statements for CD gravity or JT. And I will not have time, but it's a pity for those that, of you that are more mathematically oriented, but our results seem to match the axioms of extended topological quantum field theory, so some of you may find this uh, interesting in, in its own right, in fact. Okay, so indeed I'm going slowly. So first question, uh, is there an analog of JT uh, uh, in, in, in 3D? And I thought that I would make some observations, and, and while we go through these observations, you will see our proposal appearing and the features that this proposal satisfies. Uh, I'm not necessarily making a bigger claim than that. Uh, that, that, that that's all I will share with you. So uh, the first observation is, is, is known to many people. Uh, you know, sometimes JT is presented in a weird way, uh, depending on the picture that you take on it. Uh, but you know, if you do the most naive thing, which is take 3D gravity, spherically symmetric and do a dimensional reduction classically, uh, what, you, what you obtained is, is this action here, which is the JT action. I'm focusing on, on the Einstein-Hilbert action, but you can include the, the boundary terms. Now, the reason I'm, I'm stressing this picture here is because in, in part of the literature, not in all the JT literature, the JT, uh, the, the, the Swartian action, appears in, the, in these Lorentzian coordinates in the phi r uh, plane, not in the tr plane. This may sound like a technicality, but this JT is already Lorentzian, so, so some of the results in the literature, like in the kotler jensen analysis of 3D reparameterizations, uh, this suggests that the modular transformations in the CFT that are swapping the role of the time cycle with the spatial cycle are going to play a role. Right now this is just an observation, but it becomes a little bit more manifest if now I switch completely gears, and I go, now I'm using ADS CFT if you want to, and I go to the boundary theory. This is just to set my notation, so I'll go very quickly. Uh, keep in mind a modular invariant to the irrational CFT with a sparse uh, spectrum. Uh, this is my notation for the torus partition function. Uh, since I'm not doing Chan Simons and I'm using Brown and no boundary conditions, everything is controlled by Virasoro characters. This is, these are my characters, the vacuum one and the, the excited ones. And my, my 
I'm, I'm using the parametrization of uh, momenta in Liouville theory. Uh, so this is my parametrization for the modular parameters and the central charge. So this is just to set my notation. What is really important and known to, to experts in CFT and, and even probably non-experts is that uh, there is a universal high temperature limit that you can take in these 2D rational CFTs. So, so uh, what I mean by high temperature is that this dimensionless number, beta divided by L, is much smaller than the minimal gap in, my, in the spectrum of dimensions in, in my theory. And then working in the, in the dual channel, so I will be working with the, the, the QE tilde, it is known that the contribution of the excitations compared with the modular ones in this limit it behaves like this. This just follows from the previous Virasoro uh, characters, and this goes to zero in this limit. So in the dual channel, the claim is that for these theories, at, in, this, in this regime, the partition function is approximately the contribution from the vacuum character square. So our proposal is to take Notice that there is no near extremal limit here which gives rise to JT. So, so I'm, in principle, it, we should recover JT uh, 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 in some sense that I'll mention in, in a second. So this is uh, right now our proposal uh, for, from the CFT side to describe uh, uh, what we were trying to look for. Uh, apologies. So, sorry. sorry. Yeah, it's not, it's, it's not necessarily the same. This is a statement about the existence of a universal uh, high temperature uh, behavior of the total partition function. Okay. But in some regime of parameters, you can derive the kind of formula in, in, in that same way. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So, the, 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 so I'm, I'm not using the Gallic formula. You know, this is what, yeah. yeah. So, okay. more, more questions? Please. What is the irrational thing? Oh, uh, yeah, irrational, irrational means that this is a theory that is like, like, like you will. So it's not like of the, irrational means that, it's not, it's not, yeah, it's not in the minimum of the, that's right. Yeah, so, but if you want to think about an example, because I, uh, irrational means if the example is a model, so what Yes, yes, yes. Think about the Liouville theory if you want to have a, 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 an example. So, I mean, if you have rational central charge, is the number of characters not one? Yeah, it's number of characters. Yeah, the, this is why I was agreeing with. Yeah, with. <laughs> well, well, I, I, was tempted, I was tempted to use Neil's answer, but, but I thought that you would jump on me by not replying it. But yeah, irrational means not rational. Uh, <laughs> but, 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 but I understand that this doesn't answer the question. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, so, 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 so the, the, the next observations are trying to extract some features that this hypothetical proposal uh, satisfies. Okay, and you decide whether you are convinced by this or not. Right, so since we started with a 2D CFT uh, using the, modular, the Virasoro modular S matrices, I can rewrite our proposal. Notice that now I'm writing uh, an equality, but this comes from, from the previous uh, argument. I can rewrite it in this way. And now the observation, which is also well known, I mean, there is actually very little uh, new inputs in, in these arguments is that this partition function can be interpreted as a grand canonical partition function. So, so uh, I, I can write it in this, in this integral over p plus and p minus. These are the Liouville, uh, param the Liouville parametrization of the rational CFT. And then there are these measures. Now, the, the, the first comment, which is also well known, is that if you fix p plus and p minus, since this is grand canonical, you are summing over all of them. But if you fix your attention at fixed values or p plus and p minus, because of the dependence on this uh, eta function, uh, you can interpret this as, as a spectrum of boundary gravity. This is, this is where the descendants come uh, in, this, in this description. But uh, if you take the grand canonical partition function 
And now you take this as the full partition function of your theory. Now you can ask what is the high temperature behavior of this proposal. Uh, so how high temperature means the standard, the standard thing. And you expect that these integrals will be controlled by large p plus and p minus. So this means that the cinches that were uh, appearing in the, in the modular matrices can be approximated by exponential. So there is a well-defined saddle. But the important thing. Uh, this is again technical and more related to, to, to your point. So, so when, when C is large, then there is a unique saddle. So, so notice that since this is not a, a modular invariant theory, uh, we will only find one saddle per p plus and p minus. So you don't have the, the full SL2 set of images. So, so uh, I guess that the, the full thing about these two slides is, is, is to stress this. But as was already uh, stressed by, by these authors, I mentioned this earlier, uh, when, when you actually evaluate the saddle, what you obtain, you reproduce the entropy of the BTZ black hole. So you, you have one saddle uh, in this ensemble. And if you consider to these CFTs, which may have uh, R charge, for instance, there is a generalization of these statements. OK. So what about the low temperature in our proposal? First, a reminder. Uh, you know, uh, in my opinion, there is this very nice work by Goj, Maxfield, and Turiazzi who asked the question, can we identify the dissuasion action as a universal sector in a 2D rational CFT? And, and what these authors managed to show is that the partition function of JT appears universally in this 2D. Sorry, can you hear me if I look around? Oh, good, good, sorry. Uh, I forgot that I, I should stay here. Um, Right, now it's much louder. Uh, OK, so, so, so th th there is this well known, well, well known I, at least to some people. So I'm just letting you know that if I give you this setup of 2D rational CFTs and I study a near extremal limit, uh, this is where you get J, uh, the partition function for the JT uh, or the Schwarzian action. Now, uh, I think it's an inter As far as I know, this is not known, uh, though it's kind of hidden in this same paper. But I want to point out that you know, if I give you this, our proposal, it's not well to study it at high temperature and, uh, and at low temperature. And, uh, so so, so th there is a double scaling limit at low temperature, which I have defined here technically for you, in which our partition function, the, the, the dual channel one, uh, is actually equal to uh, the square, if you want to call it like this, of the JT partition function. So what is happening here is that in this limit, uh, even though the temperature is low, I am not tuning the so-called chemical potential, the, the potential of JT rotation, in order to make it near extreme. So that, that's why this argument still depends on mu. Mu is not equal to plus or minus uh, I or whatever. Uh, and, 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 and so this suggests that independently of a 3D inter pure gravity interpretation of this result, you should be able to compute observables in this double scaling limit universally in 2D irrational CFTs uh, in terms of JT partition function. And indeed, we have checked this, but uh, this will not be the topic uh, of the next uh, of, of this talk. So we have analyzed the high temperature regime, unique saddles, uh, low temperature is related to JT square, and in particular, if I could take the near extremal limit, I could recover JT. Now, for people that think more in terms of Chen Simons, uh, there, are, there is this, uh, let, let me make some remarks. Some of them have already appeared uh, somehow uh, earlier. So if I take a first order formulation uh, of of 3D gravity uh, in terms of Chern Simons, uh, our observation is that if we impose trivial monodromy in A tau, where tau is the time, the, the time component of the, of the connection, and I allow arbitrary monodromy around the space like one, it's important to realize that when I'm making this statement, I'm already make, breaking the symmetry, the SL2 symmetry, exchanging uh, space with, with, uh, with, uh, with time cycles. So you expect that because of this mo arbitrary monodromy, this means that you should be able to insert arbitrary defects in your, in your theory, conical defects or whatever, with some lines. 
So if you are able to compute the partition function, which is what I was showing you before, uh, that partition function is expected to compute something, and hopefully something that we may eventually agree uh, is 3D gravity. It's, uh, this theory is not modular invariant by the two reasons that I gave you, and perhaps surprisingly to some of you, uh, global ADS3 is not part of this Hilbert space, so, so when, this is the reason why I was uh, uncomfortable thinking about this for many years. Uh, but when I saw that in JD the same thing is true, then I thought, well, may, may, maybe, maybe this is an opportunity rather than, than, than a bug. So let me remind you that global ADS2 is not in JD. Uh, it's also the, 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 the Poincaré Extremo uh, patch that, that where you build the Hilbert space. So another way of saying all these things, which will be relevant for the second part of the talk, is that our proposal, as you can see in the partition function, seems to suggest uh, that, uh, that our partition function is describing a Hilbert space of some left, some chiral CFT that I'm labeling left, with some chiral CFT right. Uh, so so that's, that seems to be what we are saying. If you have followed the geometric action description of things, in particular uh, the, the important work by Kotler and Jensen on 3D reparameterizations, the connection between what I'm saying and what they did, in my understanding, is as follows. They, they identified the Alexeyev chatasvili geometric actions as fluctuations around a, a given background. So they took an eternal BTZ black hole, for instance, and they found an effective action in terms of some S1 reparameterization. But this is a reparameterization in the spatial cycle. That's what I'm trying to highlight here in blue. Uh, so you need to have a contractible spatial cycle. If you re swap the time with the space direction, which is what the modular S transformation was suggesting to us, then uh, you are looking for some, for some action in terms of these parameterizations, in terms of your time cycle. And our claim is that we will get the same type of action. Mathematically, it has the same properties. But that, then that geometric action is computing the square of the Virasoro character, the, the, the chi not square in the dual channel. So that's, that's, that's also matching. So we can add boundary matter, but, uh, but we will not do it here. Also Wilson loops. and then. Uh, I wanted to stress that there are some differences between Chern Simons and 3D gravity, but I'll wait for the factorization to stress those. So this is what I was uh, planning to do. Now we have some proposal for 3D gravity. This means that I can give you some Hilbert space and I can compute some wave functions. And so now I, I have a slightly better defined setup in order to start asking questions of bulk factorization because I'm giving you a Hilbert space. I, I should stress that before that, uh, of course, I can do this in ADS-CFT, but then I have a full microscopic theory and I have many more things to worry about. So right now I will be focusing on this chiral left, chiral right. And now I can ask, okay, so if, if we write down the Hartle-Hocken state uh, associated with the, for instance, with, with Sean's black hole, but now in ADS, of course, uh, can, uh, can I have some sort of micro, uh, uh, this is probably not the right word, but uh, microstate in quotation marks, and what I mean by that is, can I try, can I provide a statistical mechanics interpretation of this partition function, so the, the norm of the hartle hawking state, in terms of H modes living on the event horizon of the black hole? which I will be interpreting as an entangling surface because I want to divide my, my wormhole into two subregions. But I want to do this quantum mechanically because, as you know, these subregions may not be even be different invariant uh, 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 in the classical limit. So let me gauge the time, okay, so that I know what to stress. So, so, so that's the question that I would like to try to answer. Now, uh, Perhaps I should stress what is the problem a little bit more. Um, so, uh, gauge theories, gravity theories, the degrees of freedom are typically non-local. Think in terms of uh, Wilson line uh, uh, objects. So when we split 
assuming that, that you would have a different morphism invariant way of doing this, when we split the, the co-dimension one surface where we defined our states in, in whatever Hilbert space you may have in the bout, so I, I am assuming that you have that structure. When you divide this into B and B bar, the existence of Wilson lines uh, suggests that the physical Hilbert space cannot be factorized into some Hilbert space associated with the, each of these abrasions. In terms of examples and lower dimensional gravity, which is what, what I'm planning to discuss next, uh, in this paper by Harlow and Jaffaris, they took G, G, JT gravity with the, with the two boundaries, and they explicitly computed that the symplectic form in the phase space of solutions on, in this theory looks like this. And the important thing is that this capital L is some uh, regularized geodesic distance between the two boundaries. So this is not something that anyone living in B can measure. So you can not factorize. You know, in that picture, they were already using the, 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 the Hilbert spaces associated with the boundary particles. But the Hilbert space itself is already depending on the non-local gauge invariant quantity, which is the regularized geodesic. So that's why I'm stressing this formula. You can compute this explicitly. Uh, and it makes manifest that there is a non-trivial connection uh, linking information between one boundary and the other. There may be other ways of presenting this, but, but that, that's one of them. But, but it's also well known, in fact, that following the same procedure in 3D gravity for the eternal BTZ black hole, either using Kotler and Jensen, but I found the analysis in Eno and collaborators much more explicit in that sense, that in that case, uh, the, the phase space of gravity is basically the, the boundary stress tensors in, in, in the left and in the right. So you have a bunch of families that you may think that you can turn, turn on and off independently. If that would be the case, you would have some factorizable uh, Hilbert space. But what actually happens is that at the, at the level of the zero modes of this of these arbitrary functions that determine the, the expectation values of the stress tensors, there is an extra degree of freedom, which interestingly it's a Wilson line connecting the two boundaries which connects the holonomy in the right cycle with the holonomy in the left cycle. So when you actually compute what this constraint does for you, is that it relates the zero modes of the stress tensor at both, at, both, at both boundaries, and that's why the only zero modes that a black hole has are M and J instead of having both. So this correlates the, the masses and the angular moment, and you end up with one. Okay, so it's this correlation in the zero mode sector that makes manifest that there is no factorization. So that's one technical way of making the blah, blah, blah more, more explicit. Okay, so what I'm planning to do, what I was planning to do is, I have the opportunity, th there is the opportunity of, of, of telling you, well, we are gonna use the so-called extended phase, uh, Hilbert space formalism uh, but then I felt that I was not telling you why on earth this is useful. So I felt that instead of having a single slide just giving you that shot, I would embarrass myself by putting extra time trying to motivate why this is uh, the approach that some people claim that it's useful. And since I'm interested in ended up having a wormhole in, in, in my mind in one way or another, which means that I have two endpoints, I thought, okay, let's consider to the young mills in an interval uh, and you should think, be thinking of the interval as a toy model for the wormhole that will be coming in a few minutes, okay? Uh, what, what I mean by the wormhole and the interval is the Cauchy surface where I try to define my, my stage in the bulk. Remember, we are trying to quantize the bulk. So, uh, so let's take to the young mills, or you could also take the VF theory, and I'm going to impose this boundary condition. I may refer to it as entanglement boundary condition but, uh, at both endpoints, uh, x1 and x2. Now, what is important is that when I impose the Gauss law, the, 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 the physical Hilbert space uh, of this theory is, is, is the set of functions that are normalized over the, 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 gauge, the, the gauge group uh, uh, G. Now, the, the Peter Weil theorem tells us that this Hilbert space can be decomposed, sorry, please. Yeah, so, so, AT equals zero, but then that condition is not gauge invariant, so it's gauge dependent on the other. Do you think it's a gauge model? 
you you can you got you you can well th this is a boundary condition that I'm going to use to to, to define my Hilbert space. So really, I, I think that that's not gauging there. So it's a propagation transformation, say. Well, but but, but if you add term. yeah, but if you add a boundary term, you you you, you may recover gauge invariance. Oh, is it other uh, different? Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yes, oh, yes, okay. yes. And this is important. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the question. I actually. We believe that this is important to compare the answer that people obtain in condensed matter when discussing H modes and the, con uh, the chance angles calculation and in gravity. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 yeah, yeah. Thanks. So, uh, uh, yeah. Thanks for the question. Um, what I wanted to get out of here is that mathematically, uh, the Peter Weil theorem tells me that there is this decomposition uh, of the full Hilbert space, um, perhaps. What I want to stress is, is this piece here. Uh, so what the peter Weyl theorem typically can do for physicists is that it provides a basis of states for your Hilbert space. So, so let's have a look at what it says. It says that the, the, the a basis of states in this Hilbert space of t, 2D young mills is modular normalization, is the space of matrix, ele of matrix elements labeled with A and B running over the dimension of your uh, representation R. Now, in this more abstract algebra language, this tensor product representation, if you fix R, which is what I'm doing here, let, let's fix R, uh, what this is saying is that the, the matrix element A and B transform under the gauge group differently. That, 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 that's all that the Peter Wall uh, theorem is saying. But what it's also important to stress is that because of this decomposition and these uh, matrix elements, there is some action of the gauge group in both labels, A and B. This is going to be important because when we break the interval into two subintervals, uh, this is going to generate some extra gauge symmetry that we will have to quotient by. So let me make this more explicit. Um, so, in terms of the Hilbert space, what you could be tempted to say, especially if you come from gravity, you could be saying, well, the, the boundary conditions that we put at, at infinity, they define some large gauge transformations, and these large gauge transformations should become physical degrees of freedom. You may recall these H modes at the boundary of physical degrees of freedom, that's what we're doing asymptotically flat, uh, for instance, uh, that's what we could be saying. So that's this statement. Uh, but because of the Peter Weyl theorem, we already know that these large gauge transformations are the two labels, A and B, uh, labeling the basis of the states. So we know that these large gauge transformations are G and G acting at both endpoints of my interval. And the way in which they act in, in, uh, in a group basis uh, element of the Hilbert space is summarized here for you. It's left and right multiplication. Now, let's, having learned this structure, let's try to break the interval into two regions with some cut of epsilon. So my region B is going to be this, uh, this interval, and my region B bar is the other. If these two intervals could be taken separately, what we have just discussed would go through. You know, if I take to the young mills in region B, uh, and there is no B bar, the answer is given by Peter Weil, uh, uh, as described previously. So wh what we would like to view now is the, the limit, the, the point that you obtain when epsilon goes to zero is, is, is the limit of an entangling surface, which in this case is a single point. Uh, I want to impose the entangling boundary condition to be AD equal zero so that I can use the previous analysis. And because of the previous analysis, I know that there is a non-trivial action of the gauge group at the entangling surface. That action uh, defines what I will call the entangling surface GS, S for, for, for the entangling surface. Perhaps it's not a very good notation. But it's, it's again, this double copy of, of the gauge group G uh, tensor G. And it acts by left multiplication uh, on one side and by right multiplication to the other, and this color is just to indicate that this is how it acts on, on the Hilbert space. So to try to recapitulate, when we split 2D and mills in an interval into two intervals, the physical Hilbert space 
Uh, sorry, there is a natural notion of extended Hilbert space, which is the Hilbert space of each of the pieces. But the reason why this is not the physical case in, the, in this particular example, at least, is that I can multiply, th th there is an action of the entangling surface which acts on my stage on the left by right multiplication and my stage on the right by left multiplication, which leaves the fusion of the two intervals unchanged. So I need to quote it. And this is what the people that have developed this extended Hilbert space are trying to do. You, of, of course, in general, we don't know how to do this, but, but in abstract terms, if you identify a Hilbert space with region B and a Hilbert space with region B, if you know what is the symmetry that is acting on the edge sector, you quote it. OK, so these are actually the lessons that I wanted to extract uh, Okay, this is, I will skip this. Uh, what I wanted to highlight is that in this representation basis, you may get some physical intuition in terms of locality. I mean, you have a theory defined on an interval, but apparently the, 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 the role of the coordinates, which is what we would call locality, has not played any role in this decom uh, decomposition of the Hilbert space. But actually it does. So for instance, uh, since matrices, since we know how matrices can decompose by multiplication, so, so, so if I want to compute the matrix representation of the product of two elements, which is what appears in this factorization map, uh, when, when I use the property that, that this should be equal to RAC times RCB summing over C, so this is product of matrices, very elementary thing. But in terms of quantum mechanical objects, which is what these matrix elements are doing for us in this Hilbert space, this shows that the C index is an H mode. This C index is living at the uh, entangling surface where I have defined, uh, where I divided the two intervals. A more explicit way of seeing this is that if you give me a gauge field. And, uh, and I associate a, a Wilson line with it. This means that I am integrating over the entire interval. This factorization map is breaking literally the, the, the Wilson line into two pieces by the epsilon cut. So that's one way of making locality more, uh, more manifest in, in, in this story. So perhaps I didn't succeed in explaining this. I apologize, but, but I did try to avoid just giving you a, a recipe. What I was trying to convey out of this example is that in gauge theory, uh, what the people that have developed this formalism could tell you is that when you try to define these subregions, you want to define some factorization map between the actual physical Hilbert space and some extended Hilbert space. And then if you are able to identify what is the symmetry uh, that is acting on the edge modes living on this entangling surface, then you need to take this kind of quotient to identify the physical uh, degrees of freedom. Now, if we just take this, which maybe is what I should have done just in a couple of minutes, natural questions for someone that is more gravity oriented are, well, this construction seems fairly abstract in the sense that you can entertain the idea that, yeah, this may always work. Uh, but, but in an actual example, which factorization maps are the ones that we may be interested in physics, in particular in gravity? Uh, are there any relevant constraints that they should satisfy in order to capture physics? So I'm, I'm going to try to convince you in the coming minutes, and this will be actually the most important part of this second part of the talk, is that there are some conditions that are trying to capture what we call locality. So, so, so I, I'll try to uh, convey that message. And then it, it also seems extremely important to identify the physical Hilbert space in our 2D and Mills, uh, to be able to determine what is the, 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 the edge mode symmetry group that is acting on this entangling surface, and what is the spectrum of, of its representations. In the 2D and Mills, uh, perhaps I didn't explain this very well, but this almost came for free uh, in our discussion. So, what types of factorizations we may be interested in physics? So, so one idea that, that Donnelly and, and Wong put, put forward a few years ago is that, uh, well, perhaps we can think about uh, factorization 
this factorization map in terms of an Euclidean path integral. So what they had in mind is preparing a state, so time, uh, Euclidean time here flows from top to, 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 to bottom, and I, and I want to go from a, a Cauchy surface that has a single component, and I want to introduce this, this uh, entangling surface, so this, this is the pair of pans in the string theory, if you want to, uh, but, but now I'm building it as, as a split of a single Cauchy surface into two uh, D and D bar, but we need to introduce this cut of stretch horizon, if you want to, and we need to discuss which boundary conditions we are going to put there. Okay? So that's, that, that's what they meant uh, by a, a, an Euclidean path integral picture of a factorization map. And then, uh, regarding the question of which factorization maps we may be interested in, they came up with this notion that they label as drinkable boundary conditions, which in terms of pictures is, is what I was trying to allude before, which is if, if I start with some hartle hawking state, I apply the factorization map and I obtain, and I introduce this stretch horizon, I can do the same thing for the bra part of, of the hartle hawking when I compute the the, uh, the norm of the hartle hawking state. And in the limit in which I remove the stretch horizon, so notice that at epsilon different from zero, which is just trying to capture that I have a hole in here, if I just give you those objects, this defines an analogous partition function for you. So this is a non-trivial requirement that the quantum mechanical analogous partition function in the limit in which one of the cycles goes to zero recovers the disk partition function. And that's really what I would like to duel with or to use in the coming minutes uh, until the end, uh, which is closer than what I would like to, but uh, I'll get there. So the plan is basically uh, what I have just said. I want to solve this drinkable boundary condition for you in JT, and then we'll do the same in 3D, or maybe I will just do it in one of the two cases, and I will just claim what we learn in the other one. Uh, and I'll try to stress one lesson that I would like to stress, which is uh, this one, the third one, perhaps. Okay, so JT. In JT, we have said that the Cauchy slice is the wormhole connecting the two, the two uh, asymptotic boundaries. And in this case, uh, the literature gives us a Hilbert space. I will denote this by, by this Hilbert space of the, the two boundaries. And luckily, this, this can be described by some quantum mechanics of uh, particles living at the boundaries. And the basis of this Hilbert space is given by some uh, real positive number k and some zero modes, which I'm labeling i left and i right. These are the remnants of the Brown and no boundary conditions that distinguish between Chern Simons and 3D gravity or, or Cat Moody versus Vera Soro. Uh, Okay, but perhaps more, more, uh, more pictorially for the locality picture that you may have is that the, the wave functions in JT also have, uh, uh, oh, it's written here. Uh, the, the wave functions can also be understood as uh, matrix elements in some representation, like in our 2D uh, Young Mills example. The difference here is that now G is SL2R, belongs to the group SL2R, and the label K is, 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 is a continuum. Uh, sorry. Okay, but, but the discussion in terms of diagrams is going to be the same. It's just that now I'm giving you a theory which has a some gravity interpretation, but the objects that were appearing in our abstract discussion can be computed. So what are the answers? The this partition function, which is the norm of the hartle hawking state, looks like this. So, so that's what we need to reproduce. The Euclidean path integral uh, generating the hartle hawking state is given by this state. It's like a thermophile double. And the, what the factorization map wants to achieve is a map between the physical Hilbert space and splitting the wormhole into two, where the new endpoint is the stretch horizon that, or, or the event horizon of, of the black hole, if you want to. So the, this is the split that I'm looking for. In terms of path integrals, you are going from, from this state to a pair of paths. OK, so these drinkable boundary conditions is literally taking the limit of the annulus 
of this hole here going to zero. But I can take a, a, a different uh, interpretation of this partition function, which is think of these angles. So let's take epsilon final before taking the limit. And now think about it in some, uh, in what you may call the closed string channel. So I want to view this as, a, a, as, a, as an amplitude between two states. And in order to appreciate what the Wilson, uh, well, what the Wilson lines are, uh, are doing for you, I can introduce a, a, a resolution of the identity, which is this, this, the identity being a sum over all the, uh, the possible insertions, the continuous representations lambda. And then in this representation, which is the right-hand side, the partition function at finite epsilon, which is the analogous one, can be written as an integral over lambda of some inner partition function and some outer one. Now, all these things are computable, so let, let's see what we learn from here. The, the insertion of a, of a Wilson line includes this wave function, that's the cosine, and this gives me the outer partition function. And the inner partition function is just the closed string propagation of this lambda towards some boundary state E, which is whatever is living in the stretch horizon that we have introduced. That's the entangling surface that we are interested in, and that's the object that I obtain. These ringable boundary conditions tells you that this Z disk should, be, should, should equal the epsilon going to zero limit of this object, and what we learn is that whatever is living in the inner partition, uh, in, the, in the stretch horizon, which is this E boundary state, uh, has to satisfy this, this wave, uh, has to have this wave function. So let me compare these objects. When I compare the outer with the inner horizon, notice that in blue you have the contribution from the insertion of the Wilson operator. Uh, then you have the contribution from the Hamiltonian. The epsilon is normal because you are pinching to zero. So, so, so that, that, that's the standard redshift uh, effect in, in GR. If you want to, we are pinching epsilon to zero. And the new effect uh, in the interior is the appearance of some non-trivial density of states, which we are going to interpret as a density of edge states. These are localized on the entangling surface, uh, and they also match with the math literature, who says, which say that, the, that this is the measure that you associate with the space of normalizable functions on the semigroup SL2R+. plus. This is the work of Ponsot and, and Teichner. So what we want to say is that this wrinkable boundary, this is an important lesson, is that in JT, this wrinkable boundary conditions fixes the notion of H-mode symmetry, what I call GS in the 2D and Mills case, to be the semi-group SL2R+, uh, and that the representations that, that appear are the continuous series representations in that case. Uh, what I claim, but this is technical, is that if I use this data and we use the same tricks as in the 2D and Mills case, we can factorize the, the hartle hawking state in this way. And to finish, because I, I, am, I am on time already, so, so let's do the same thing in 3D. Uh, and apologies for rushing, but, but I hope that the main message has already been achieved. Um, in 3D, Using our proposal, the Hilbert space with two asymptotic boundaries, I'm using the same notation as before, is the span of left and right uh, CFT uh, states. Now I have descendants, so I need to include them. Remember, descendants are not present in JT. Uh, I remind you that the zero modes are constrained, so my Hilbert space has to satisfy this. This is very important, otherwise you will not be describing the, the BTC black hole physics. Uh, and, but the, in terms of pictures, it should be clear what we need to compute. Now, in this case, uh, in this picture here, what I have is I have an extra cycle, which makes the, the, the theory three-dimensional. But in terms of the Cauchy slice in the radial direction, if you want to, uh, I still have the, the stretch horizon that I am introducing. So if another way of viewing this picture is that I have a solid torus, but I am removing a very thin torus in the interior. That's, that's what the stretch horizon is doing. And the question is, can we compute these objects uh, in uh, our proposal uh, using results from 2D CFT? And the answer is yes. 
Uh, this is the same formulation as before. We introduce a resolution of the identity in terms of Wilson loops. Uh, the partition function that I'm interested in can be written as an integral of an inner part and an outer part. The outer part knows about Brown and no boundary conditions. The inner part knows about entangling boundary conditions. And the claim, sorry, uh, is that if I use the intuition that the interior uh, part of the partition function should behave like Chen Simons, that's the partition function that the condensed matter literature would use. And in particular, this uh, character diverges when you take the pinching going to zero. This is because we have descended and there is an infinite number of degenerates. That would give rise to an infinite uh, value for the entanglement of the, of the black hole. But we know that that is finite. So, uh, so this is summarized here. First comment, this does not satisfy these drinkable boundary conditions. And second, it diverges. If we actually solve this drinkable boundary condition, what we obtain is, is a deformation of the inner partition function in which there is a non-trivial density of states which we want to interpret as a density of H modes living at the entangling surface. But this thing here still depends on the Liouville parameter B, which depends on the central charge. And actually, this, this dimension here, this is in red here, this is the density of states. This actually agrees with a quantum deformation of the Plancherel measure of the quantum group of SL2R+. plus. So there is a deformation that appears in Tejner's work when working in Liouville's theory, uh, extending the space of uh, integrable functions on this quantum group with this non-trivial measure. If you want to, this is some kind of generalization of the peter weyl theorem for this quantum group. Uh, so, so that's what we are obtaining out of these drinkable boundary conditions. And, and I claim that this solves the factorization problem. I should highlight that the appearance of quantum groups in this context has a huge literature. So uh, I'm not claiming that this is new, but, but I, I think it's relevant for the factorization problem. Uh, it has a connection, well, one of my collaborators is going to kill me with extended topological quantum field theory, but I will not explain this. I'm happy to comment it offline. And this is the summary. Thank you, and sorry for going over time. <laughs>